All right, BMX, today is Wednesday. It's August 25th. Welcome to the Dog Walk presented by Barstool Sports. Another free swim for you here. It's myself, Dante Chief. Got a good documentary we're going to cover. I mean, also, for the record, these don't always have to be documentary reviews. No. We're just kind of... Uh, I don't know how we got in the habit of Yeah, that. I don't know. It, it's a good starting point for sure. Mm -hmm. And actually, I do think it might kind of go different ways because I would say this is the first one out of the three where I didn't really love it. Oh, really? I did not really was, love I it. I wanted more. Did and you? I, and I know that, like, we talked about the, uh, the amusement park one was an Eddie Doc. This was a Chief Doc. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, every, yeah, yeah. any way you slice it. See, that's funny. Like, I feel like I would have enjoyed it more, like, if you were right next to me and, like, we hit pause and you're like, you yeah. gave me the ancient Well, we will like do that today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, hopefully we'll, we'll counter with some of that today. <laughs> you said it. We were out there while you were interviewing Dave, and we were kind of like, pre-gaming for this and he was just dropping knowledge bomb after knowledge bomb Dude, on me. yes that's why i needed yeah. it. I like when yeah. i do shit like that because it was and i didn't we didn't say it. it's red penguins red right penguin here, yeah. so it's about a ho ice hockey team in russia yeah and um yeah i mean I, I don't even know where to start i know where to start i i said this to ryan when i came in i had no idea about any of this did you he did obviously because he's a huge hockey guy. I, I had like I didn't know about this specific. So this was, we should just tee it up. So this was it's called Red Penguins, and this is the it's on Hulu. It's on Hulu, which I am now thanks to this documentary, a Hulu <laughs> Disney oh, Plus. Did you? I held out. I, I rented it. Okay, <laughs> so I was I was doing the economics, and I I I, had, I just had Disney Plus, and like Hulu is the one thing I've been holding out on. And it's like it's thirteen ninety nine or whatever, and then like if I rent it, it's three ninety nine. Ah, fuck it, like I'll just because I knew I'm gonna get Hulu because they're carrying hockey games uh, in the uh, during the season this year too. Like they're gonna streaming games, so let's so get right, the the, the bundle earlier. and whatever. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but this was you guys are saying like oh it was a Russian hockey team. No, that's like that. I would say that that's an underselling. This is it was CSK Moscow. Which stands for it's like the uh, the sporting club of the army. That's what the CSK in their language stands for. So it's the Red Army team. It's the team that we saw in Miracle. Oh, it's, fuck. I it's don't even the think Yankees. Like... Yeah, I don't think they did a good enough job explaining like how significant this team was. No, they did not at R all. Right, and this is during the '90s. So this this whole documentary really takes place from let's say 90, 1990 to. 97 98 something like that and this is the reconstruction or you know the rebirth of the russian nation after the collapse of the soviet union so you had you know this for the first time ever you had this influx of american capital and and capitalist ideas into all facets of the russian culture including the hockey team so, so that was properly conveyed Yes. That was yes. like that knocked you in the face with like, hey, it's, Whole, that, it was fucking crazy. That yeah. like people like were allowed to live a little bit and then mm -hmm. it still was crazy. Yeah. And they didn't even know they had no idea what to do. That was like yeah. shocking. Because they had never been in a system before. So that that's kind of where we go back where it's like, all right, this is this is like this is the New York Yankees, okay? And the 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 country collapses and it's like now we have to like pick up the New York Yankees, but they have no money. They're playing in this dilapidated shit rink that like it would. I looked at that picture. I'm like, that's the worst rink I've ever seen. And that's the that's the stadium for the Yankees of, of Russian, like bigger than the Yankees, like the Yankees and the Cowboys like combined. So even when they were the fucking communist and there were studs, it was still like that. That's what that's what they made it seem like. So it's like this is the rink, But that's how, how commun can that be because it's if that if we're talking about the fall of communism where it's like they just don't have money for things like they just they, if you weren't getting financial support from the government which is what everything relied on back for 100 years or 80 years as long as that system had been around so when that money starts to dry up because they're putting it more and more towards nukes and they're putting it more and more towards you know army and tanks and they're trying to you know they're trying to steal uh, microchip I, stuff they're just like that what really ended the Cold War was that Reagan and others used the dollar as a weapon and the Russians just could not keep up. And so they started putting all their resources to uh, trying to keep up and everything else fell by the wayside and the whole system collapsed. But I thought they cared about sports. I thought that's they something they looked into is mm -hmm. like, oh, this, we're going to be proud of this. Like we're going to yeah. build this up and people yeah. will really not. I mean, the Olympics. And they did. And they, and, they, and they used to really do that. 
And then when they couldn't, when they started to have fewer and fewer resources, that's some of the things that got like a, a haircut in the budget was the hockey team. And that, that CSK Moscow, which is the stand, it was the Red Army team, was clearly one of those things that took a significant haircut. And they also had the problem, and this is what Dante and I were talking on uh, the pre-show, all the best guys had had defected and gone to America. And the NHL was like pilfering. All yeah, the oh, yeah you saw Fedorov and Bure. I mean, yeah, well, and, it, and it's and it had been going on for like six, seven years. And what you know, they didn't really talk about this in the doc, but they've shown it in other ones that. But I, I just so that you can get into this, like, because mm-hmm. you did such a good job explaining to me out there. My question was. They, one of their big complaints, that uh, Gushin guy, mm-hmm. who, what a scumbag that guy big was, by the way. <laughs> but, like, he... He, he was like want, a product of the time. He what, was, who, like, so fine with being a scumbag. Yeah. Loved it. <laughs> loved yeah, it. He, he thought it was hilarious. <laughs> Embrace yeah. the role. Yeah. yeah. What, what, would you, what would you compare his title or, like, wh- what was his position so like czar, like he, hockey czar. He was no. So that was that was the uh, the general guy that they talked to. The, the guy Gushin was effectively like a president or general manager of of the team, which the team was owned by the government. And the reason the documentary is called the Red Penguins is because they were effectively bankrupt. Okay, and nobody was going to the games, and nobody cared. They weren't getting the government support, so like it was impossible for them to go bankrupt previously. They were the Penguins came in, bought fifty percent of the team. Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh the, Penguins, the Pittsburgh Penguins. So you, this was like it was, and this is something that came out kind of later in the documentary is that they they took they were like they did it because they needed the money, but eventually they like took it as a slap in the face. You take the Red Army team, and they're like, now you're the Red Penguins, you're the Russian Penguins. And it's like, we're the penguins? Like, we're the fucking, we got this little fat bird that can't fly. It's named after a team in some, you know, nondescript U.S. city in, you know, Pennsylvania. We're the pen- fucking penguins. And it's, so it's like, they took that as kind of like a, like, they didn't, they never like sat right with them. But they, so they lost the hammer and sickle and they get this little penguin logo. It's like, fuck. But th- that was you, I, I lost the my qu- what no, question. No, but had. so my question to you was, you know, this Gushin guy. They yes. were all complaining like mm-hmm. the NHL is stealing all our talent. Yeah, like no wonder we can't generate money because mm-hmm. all our best players are going over there because they're stealing them. And I said to you, <laughs> we're talking about Soviet, like communist Russia. Like how the fuck of all places mm-hmm. were they allowing people to leave there? Yeah, because you know, like. Cuba and baseball. I mean, it was so right, hard for these guys. You hear about the guys getting on the rafts but and going you, across. But you told me it was almost even more elaborate than that. Like these guys were. Yes. So that was if. And if you look at um, and different players have different experiences, but a lot of these guys that came over initially, Fatisov, um, Konstantina Fedorov, Alexander Mogilny, they were not allowed to just leave. So they would be on these Goodwill tour games playing, you know, the, the Red Army team. And this is back when the Red Army, this is the late 80s, mid to late 80s now. They're still awesome. Like, because they have all these guys who became household names in the 90s, Beret, you know, et cetera, that they still had all those guys. So it's like, how the fuck, you know, they, so the Detroit Red Wings and other teams, Buffalo would draft them. And like, you know, back when they had 12 rounds, or they take, yeah, we'll take Alexander McGillney in, in the 11th round. And, and I'm making up that number, but it was a late round pick. And it was like, well, you take them there because you're probably never going to be able to get them because it's impossible. They would have like these intricate like, hey, like we have a visa waiting for you. Been in touch with the State Department, you know, talking privately. Uh, hey, the guards are at the door, the Russian guards, but they don't really speak English, but they might. So they might be KGB guys who go over and talk to them. You make these arrangements, you hand them a duffel bag with, and there's a note in it or you give them a book and there's a note in it. And they, you know, and then it's like, all right, go to this fire escape. Damn. Go to this elevator and we'll have a limo waiting for you in the alley and we'll take you to the State Department. You'll sign your papers and you, you defect. And that, so it was like almost like a secret ops, like James Bond style situation. But how are, how are they not on a watch list once they're taken in the 11th round, right? You would think that they but would they, have they, But they were. They had to be extremely careful. And it's like if Damn. you if you do get caught defecting, like there's big time punishments for that. You don't get to just go back and be a part of the Red Army team. You go to the fucking gulags. Isn't that that's crazy? crazy. Yeah. So that's like another thing I wish they had talked about in the doc. And there's another doc called, uh, there's one called The Russian Five. And then there's another documentary that uh, is 
Which, dude, that's so funny when you brought those names up. I remember my friend having that poster up on his wall of like the the it was like the Red Army, and it yeah. was like well, they called them the Russian those, Five because and they all like played. It was like the only time I can remember uh, as a fan where it's like you usually have your forward line of three and your D pair of two, and you kind of mix and match. The Red Wings were like, we're just going to take all five Russian guys, and you guys just play all at the same time. So it was Fatisov and Konstantinov on defense, and it was Larionov, Kozlov, and Fedorov. And they all played together the whole time. And it was like, they're speaking Russian with each other. They're passing the puck. They're doing crazy Russian shit. And that was – but they got all those guys. And a lot of them, they had to go through, like, extreme measures to get them into the NHL and into America legally because the Soviet Red Army, it was still the Soviet Union at that time in the, in the mid to late 80s, it was not like, oh, yeah, sure, just go. Those did not seem like the kind of guys you wanted to cross at all. Well, and that was like the story where they, they brought in the guy who ran all of he, – he was a, a general in the Army still. This is, this is now into the 90s, and the, the Penguins had bought 50% of the team. And Russia – I'm surprised that you didn't like it, or one of the things that I came away from was – I want a whole documentary on just Russia in the it, 90s. Yes, it's not that I didn't like it. I liked what was being told. I just thought they kind of told it a little shitty. Okay. I can That's get, what yeah, I thought. Yeah. Like, I was like, holy fuck. You're right. Once I saw some of that footage, look, listen, this is third time doing this. It's been train wreck after train wreck after train <laughs> yes. wreck. And this was arguably the biggest train wreck. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So I liked that. I just didn't like how they presented it. Okay, that's, you know? that's fair. Yes. That's I thought fair. it was like, yeah, a little I mean, sloppily done. And this, shit. this was for listeners too. This was only ninety minutes long. It was mm -hmm. a quick one. I I expected when I realized what the topic was, I was like, oh, this is going to be a deep dive. But they kind of got in everything really quick mm -hmm. in yeah. and out. Yeah, I mean, we didn't even talk about the Disney part yet. Oh, we, yeah, we should get to that. Well, too. before we really get into it, we do want to talk about while well, we enjoy documentaries, while we enjoy watching hockey, we like to do it while enjoying a nice ice cold, great tasting, less filling Miller Lite. This is a day for it. it oh, yeah. So it's hot. a thousand degrees. And I know people are, you know, the beer snobs out there, they're all this IPA, this, a stout, that, a cookie, cookie dough, stout, whatever. Fuck that. This is a day where you need that great tasting, less filling white can with the little droplets of condensation on the side because it's that hot and there's only one thing that works, and that's Miller Lite. Yeah, you're not getting that fucking Bloody Mary with the cheeseburger attached. It's going to make you shit your pants. And, right. You know, fuck that. You need a Miller Lite. Go get a Miller Lite. The next time you're getting ready to enjoy cold ones with your crew, Go to MillerLite.com forward slash Redline to find the delivery options near you. Or you can pick up some Miller Lite pretty much anywhere that they sell beer. It's Miller time. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 96 calories and 3.2 carbs, excuse me, per 12 ounces. Go get a Miller Lite. Dante, you're pumping them out, I'm sure, at the bars. Can't um, keep them in stock. We actually had a call this morning, and 40s are nowhere to be found. Everyone's drinking. Really? Everyone's drinking Miller Lite 40s. <laughs> The last few weeks. Well, you've always like I've always appreciated you just having the tall boy cans there too. The, the only things we can get our hands on are the regular, damn, Miller Lite cans yeah. right okay. now. Yeah, so right. there you they're go. flying. Appreciate them if you have them. Um, okay, Disney. So yeah, right. We talk about the Disney part. Yeah. So now, like with Russia opening up the economy, that is, and, and just politically. So now it was like, hey. Uh, you know, we've been closed for business for, with America for the most part for 100 years, give or take. We're now open to American corporations. So like we said, the Penguins went in and, you know, they started having some success. And they, you know, in terms of they turned the rink around, they the team started playing better and it became more of like a financially viable, at least in the beginning, operation. So when they first got there, they're like, hey, like we uh they just had no idea how to run a business. So it's like, we take money in, we spend that on the organization, that allows us to keep the business going. They just had no concept of that whatsoever. <laughs> it was like, it was absurd. Like they had never seen a balance sheet before in their life. They just hadn't, they just did not get it. But American businesses like Pepsi, Coca-Cola, yeah. Disney, VIX, uh, and that was the other thing. So they <laughs> talked about, they talked, remember we were talking about this, the Red Army team. Yeah. Well, the head coach of this team, the R Russian Penguins, was Viktor Tikhonov, and he was the head coach of the Russian team in 1980 that the United States beat, the, the Miracle on Ice team. So, like, did he, they say that? They glossed over it. 
Okay. Okay, because I don't like. Right. Exactly. They convey that he was like a, a, a real hard nosed coach who cared about what happened on the ice, but I don't remember them being like, "Hey, he was the guy." He's the guy. Like what? They I, I understand they the probably, eyebrows, the whole thing. Like that's Victor Tikhonov. He was the he was the coach. I mean, I who, get you can't show Olympic footage because that's probably a million. Fucking you can't hold, show him holding a gold medal or show him on the podium. You know, like I'm sure they had things that, they, or they could have just said it. Yeah, they, had all, they had all these pictures of him. And it's not like that was the only team he ever coached as the 80 team. Like he yeah. has gold medals under his resume. So it, it, that was like strange that they kind of gloss over like he was like an icon. And they, they mentioned it like, yeah, like he was a colonel in the army. Like he's a colonel in the army because he made the hockey team good. He has no military <laughs> background to really speak of. But like that's how the Soviet Union worked. It was like, hey, if you're like everything is the government. So if you're the highest ranking hockey coach. You're not just like, hey, you're, congratulations, here's a Jack Adams for Coach of the Year. It's like, no, here's a military pension and a rank. Uniform. And a, and a uniform. The whole, they're decorated, the whole thing, because you're in the Army. <laughs> like, you're the head coach of the Army team. You're not in the Army, but you're in the Army. And um, so that was Victor Tikhonov was the coach. And so but back to the Disney thing, Disney, like everybody else, was like, this is a new market with a shit ton of people in Europe that we should be able to make money off of. And so Disney was like, this is a really interesting story where we have these Americans, the Penguins go over and buy the, you know, 50% of the team and they revitalize the team. And then they said, um, I think it was Howard Isley, who was the- uh, uh, Michael Eisner. Michael, I thought his name was Howard something. Uh, there, but yeah, you're right, Michael Eisner. Mm -hmm. And- um, There was a guy, I think, believe Howard took over for him. Uh, yeah. And um, but the the guy who was running Disney at the time was that was Eisner. It was Eisner. Yeah. Okay. And he was like, "Hey, like we have uh, like I already have the plot for Mighty Ducks five, and it's going to be we're going over there, we're playing the Russian team, and there's a love interest. But now like the Cold War is over, so they're able to make it work. And they had this whole plot filled out, and they did this American goodwill tour with the Russian team. They have them tour around and play the United. You know, in the summer they would play." Uh, you know, all the AHL and IHL teams. So they play like Indianapolis, the Roadrunners, all these different, all these different teams in the, in the United States. And they would sell their jerseys and the jersey sales sales were going well because like Russian hockey at that time was no longer the enemy. It was like Russian hockey is actually sweet because Beret is fucking sweet and Fedorov is sweet and McGilney scored 79 points. And, you know, and, and, and like they they were like this, like, oh, like, this is the cool thing. Like, if you're cool, like I remember being a kid seeing like I wanted these Nike skates. Like Dude, I never the got, Fedorov skates, cause the Fedorov commercials, the Fedorov skates, they were like white. And um, he they showed this, like, I think it was 96 because the Olympics, the Summer Olympics in Atlanta were going on. And he puts on these Nike skates and he just whips around the ice. And they're like, he's going to race the fastest man on earth. It's like some Jamaican sprinter. And they had the Jamaican sprinter running on like ice, like, you know, like he's <laughs> uh, with his shoes. And he, Fedorov does a lap around the rink. Goes, okay, he's not so fast. <laughs> you know, so like it was like they were just like marketed properly. Like they were cool. And so Disney wanted some of that action. So they were like, hey, like we think this CSK Moscow Red Penguins is a hundred million dollar brand and the russians just the guys the russian partners who own the other 50 percent they just didn't really they were still not warm to capitalism like these were old school soviet union guys and they told this story about hey like nike's one of our sponsors we're gonna have a nike day at the rink and they're like okay so they take they go into the rink the night before they dig out all the Nike stuff on the ice. They peel off all the banners and shit on the boards and around the rink and replace it with Adidas for free. And they're like, what? This what? That's like $100,000 in your pocket that you just like spit on. Like, why the fuck would you do that? And they're like, because it's still our team. And they just didn't give a fuck. They just did not give a fuck. They don't understand capitalism. They don't understand how to, how to make money. And so the things got so, and they started bringing in other partners and like, who are, who are these guys? <laughs> that was uh, great. The Russian mob. That was great. So they, it started to show up these meetings with Disney and uh, you know, the, the American owners from the penguins and the Russian owners. And they're like, yeah, we cut him in from our, from our piece. Don't worry about it. He's our partner now. 
And it's like, well, who the fuck is he? <laughs> and it's like, don't worry about that either. And it's like they do a little research and it's like, hey, we're now in bed with the mafia. And Disney eventually was like, well, we, we just can't have anything to do with it, these people. It is hard to fault them, though. Like picture that when they walked in and they looked up and they saw that Coca-Cola sign. Yeah. Like they're like, what the f- what is that? <laughs> You know what I mean? They're probably so confused. Yeah. So one of the stars of this doc, that Stephen Warshaw guy. Yeah. So the the Penguins owners, Howard Baldwin and Tom Ruda, they were like, yeah, we're not going over there. We're not running this. We need a guy. They found this marketing upstart. It's like a whiz kid. Yeah. Yeah. It's like quirky Jewish kid, Stephen Warshaw, um, who was like, send me. I want to go. Yeah. Which is fucking crazy. But... He was gung ho. They sent him over there and they basically told him, you know, turn this place around, which he did. I yeah. mean, he pulled out every minor league baseball gimmick, it seemed like. I mean, they were doing like. And more. They were doing strip teases at intermission, which was fucking hilarious. Insane. Yeah. So, one of the things that they talked about <laughs> in the beginning of this is when he goes over there and Chief was talking about the rink is just falling apart. There are like homeless people living in the suites. <laughs> um, Nothing worked. Electricity wasn't working. They said you couldn't see out of the boards because they were so scuffed up. Yeah, so the glass. It was the glass. It was just like, well, if anybody wanted to watch the game <laughs> and you had glass seats, which in America go for like 500 bucks a pop, they're like, well, glass seats are actually the worst seats because you can't see through the fucking glass. It, like every everything that could be wrong with that team was wrong. Where are these guys played? So when they were showing, they were cutting back and forth from this rink to like the American rinks and stuff. It reminded me of... The scene in Rocky Three when they show Rocky and like Clubber training, like Clubber Lang's training in this like yeah. warehouse basement, like doing pull ups on like fucking and Rocky's the got like robots yeah. bringing him shit. Yeah, yeah, like that. That's what it reminded me of. But uh, this Warshaw guy comes in and just starts pulling out every like rabbit out of his hat that he can, and they're doing all these promos. He's lining up all these sponsors. They're selling everything. One of the things that really blew my mind about this was he is credited with inventing advertising sales on the boards yeah they said before it wasn't it wasn't really a thing yeah, yeah it was just white boards right. in the rink and i mean we've grown up that's all we've known really yeah. but uh he, it, it's it's like jarring when you watch old hockey footage from like the like edmonton oilers and stuff and then it's just like there are no ass <laughs> like what is going on here so this guy was selling every square inch of, of space in this arena and on the jerseys and everywhere on the Zamboni, mm -hmm. like on the referees, everything was for sale. Yeah. And they would do things like they had free beer night. So he's like, we would have 14 year old kids just showing up and getting absolutely <laughs> fucking shit. Hammered. That was awesome. Yeah. And like they and like they, the opening of the dock there, he's just like going around to these like different like Russian kind of nightclubs. And he's like, there's just like hookers and naked chicks. Everywhere in the basement, too. everywhere. Yeah, in the basement of the rink. Yeah, yeah. It was fucking bananas, and it was it was it's like the wild wild west, like the old west, like before like America and the law came out there. You just have these little like outpost towns where guys would just shoot each other in the street, and everyone was like, "Well, <laughs> that guy lost." That was like the entire country of Russia with modern technology. It's fucking bananas. Live bears. Live bears. Yeah, yeah, they had the yeah. they had the, the bears. Thing. The bears were like, can we get the bears yeah. to serve beers? They're like, yeah. Like we yeah, can do yeah. that. Like, what do you mean? How are you gonna have a bear serve a beer? But they fit you know, they just you know were trying everything. My favorite part of that though, I it had to be my guy Gushin just fucking installing like a hundred thousand dollar sauna. <laughs> yeah. That, well, that that was the beginning of the end. That was right, and that was because th when they started out, they like they recognized that they needed help, and they like had no money. They said that they they were selling tickets just because they didn't understand the financials. That they were selling tickets to the public for the equivalent of six cents. It was six U.S. cents was what they were going for, and it's just because they just had no idea how to run a business. So they start getting money in, and. Like you said, they put this like mar like Italian marble tile, like this the most beautiful Russian Turkish bathhouse thing you've ever seen in their basement. And they had the guy Warshaw went up to him like when things were going bad. He's like, Look it, I gotta tell you the truth. We had budgeted in 
for you to steal two hundred thousand dollars from us a year, but you stole a million. <laughs> so it's like this is a fucking problem, you know. So it's like what, like what, what is going on? Like you have to be a fucking laxed, like knowing you're taking on a project business opportunity. If you budget in two hundred thousand dollars being stolen, just stolen. Like we knew <laughs> you're gonna, yeah. You and can you imagine off. that Dante opening up a place and being like, hey, we gotta listen. We it's a great location. It's it's hopping, it's jumping, and but we know like the owner's gonna like the the, the manager's gonna take. There's skim like, spill. Yeah, that's much spill. Of, it's crazy. That's the spill. But to to Chief's point, I mean, they had a sit down. That was this was this part was like, it was kind of scary because you felt for these guys that invested all this money and time. And this Warshaw guy moved over there, yeah, and you could just see like these Russian guys would just stare like this Gushin guy. He's he looks exactly like he did 20 years yeah. ago, 30 mm-hmm. years ago. And he's sitting there and he's just, they give zero fucks. And he's like, no remorse. They have a breakdown of all the financials. And they were like, yeah, so these guys basically had a system where it would be $1 for the US, $1 for Tikhanov, $1 for Gushin. <laughs> so like out of every $3 they made, the the U.S. investors were seeing like a dollar, right. maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe. And then it. they cut in the the mafia guys. So then they sit down with these guys and they tell them, and and the Russians are just like, yeah, we're sorry, we won't do it anymore. And it got worse. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then the wheels completely came off the thing. Yeah. You think, because, like you said, then the mob right. saw their fucking well, and that was the part chance. that I I would have I would love like a HBO like multiple part eight part documentary and just Russia in the nineties. Under because it seemed it it was it was lawless and it, and it was and it reminded me of that scene from you guys ever seen Air Force One to get off my plane mm-hmm. okay so he's talking to the Russian guy and they're like you know, they're beating the shit out of Harrison Ford he's like you turned our like once proud nation into a country of gangsters thugs and prostitutes and he was blaming America for that and you saw like. Not to the degree where they're hijacking Air Force One, but you saw like a like a fuck these Americans type situation. Look at our country. Like we were we were the Soviet. You were a world power. And now it's just complete and utter chaos. And that like attitude kind of came through. And we talked about this guy, the general before where they Disney came, all the Disney execs came over and they and they met with the general who ran all of who was in charge of all of sports for for Russia, and he had been in that position in the Soviet Union. They bring him, they're like, it was a vault within a vault within a vault, like these big steel doors, and at every level was guys with machine guns. And you sit down, and this guy makes a fist and he just slams it on the table. And he's like telling people, like, hey, like, you know, this is still our team, and don't, you know, don't fuck with us, and this and that. And they finally, because things were so out of control with the mafia at the end, that they went to him for help. And he was basically like, yeah, fuck you. Like I'm not like the the Red Army is not coming to your aid. Right, we're gonna, we're gonna let you guys die with the gangsters, yeah. and uh, and it was just because they still had this disdain for America and American values, and it was and it was and then the the documentary kind of ends with the transition of power from Boris Yeltsin to Putin. So we think about Russia, and it's like man, it is crazy that they've had since the fall of communism two guys. Because that is crazy. they had Putin and then they had Medvedev, who was the acting prime minister or president for like a period of four or five years, just while Putin was able to like legally change the Russian constitution to put himself back in power. So he was still like, he stepped down because he had term limits. Then he's like, you know what? Fuck term limits. I'm back. And the other guy's like, cool. I was never really doing anything, anyways. <laughs> so it's crazy that you see like this young Putin come in and that's how the documentary ends. And it's like, no wonder. Like Russia just kind of goes along with whatever he says now as what it seems like you have. Obviously, we've talked about a couple of their other issues, um, uh, Navalny and this and that over the over the course of this. We've done that on the show. But it's like if you went back to, the, to 1997, 1998 and the country was in complete and utter chaos, just nothing but, you know, mafia, drugs, murder in the streets that they would, you know, kind of gravitate towards this authoritarian Putin. And he, you know, clamped down on everything and made it like a livable country, which it wasn't in the 90s. All right. I got I got four different things to bring up. here. OK. <laughs> First thing, are we are we totally sure that the Warsher wasn't 
skimming anything. He f- definitely fucking was. But that was funny at the end where they, they offered him a job. Like, hey, like, you know, the Americans have pulled out. Why don't you just run it? We'll run it ourselves. And they, he's like, hey, like, uh, how much will you pay me? And he was like, well, that's less than what they're paying me. He's like, yeah, but we'll give you all the drugs and the women you want. He's like, I can get, I can buy all that <laughs> yeah, shit myself. Yeah, I had it. yeah. And then they're like, well, then you need to get the fuck out of this country. And they're like, well, he's like, well, I don't know if I want to do that either. He's like, like, no, you better go. And they're like, they alluded that it would be like, they would have him killed. And they're like, well, what's the price for a hit on me? They're like 6,500 bucks. Like they had already like Holy mapped fuck, out, yeah. like they'd, they'd contact people like how much will it t- cost to kill this fucking American uh, professional sports business guy? Yeah, 6,500 bucks. Yeah, I'd say it was, there was a chance he was skimming stuff. Yeah. For sure. Um, do you now? Now this, another thing we forgot to bring up with Disney was that Michael Eisner just completely denied involvement altogether. That was crazy. That was crazy because there were like documents, like signed documents. Yeah, I, what's stuff. that about? I don't, I don't know. Maybe he just didn't want any connection to the Russian mafia or the Russian state at that time because it was very shady business. So the, the whole thing kind of went to shit, and it was they were showing news clips from like you know. Brian Williams and like Larry King, everybody was in awe of this Baldwin guy and the Penguins. And I mean, this Baldwin guy, he seemed like kind of a, a like a nut job. Yeah. But he put together a pretty fucking awesome like investment team. Like he got Lemieux involved. Mm-hmm. Michael J. Fox was involved. That was crazy too. <laughs> but you also have to remember at that time, the Penguins were on top of the world. Like that was the early 90s. They won the cup in 91 and 92. So like they were they were like the it team with Mario and Yager and you know Ron Francis shout out our good friend Ron Francis yeah. and uh, so they were kind of like the it team so it kind of makes sense that it would be them to a but degree I, but I do wish I don't think I don't think they showed enough reaction to their decision to make this move yeah like they just showed like a Larry clip oh Larry King like you really think that this is you're gonna do this like, like well, you had to think people like didn't think this was a good idea right oh it had to be yeah. They didn't really go into that Crazy. at all. Crazy. They also didn't say, at least not that I uh, what the purchase price was. Yes. They didn't, uh, yeah. They didn't, yeah. They didn't do that either. Right. That's wow, I was you're like, right. I didn't even yeah. realize that till now. Like, how big, how how much did they really care? You know? It had to have been a significant amount because that, w- I mean, it was like dire straits when they got there. And, I mean, remember the coach was saying, like, these players were so fucking poor that they were like sharing equipment and jerseys. Yeah, that was that was fucking crazy too. And it was so it would be like the youth program. <laughs> so like, you know, so it'd be like, all right, the top team plays first. They they practice at you know make up times at five o'clock. They go for an hour and a half. All right, then the the U eighteen guys come out and it's just like, well, hey, try to find a guy similar in size to you. You're gonna wear his jersey because they just didn't have any equipment. They didn't have sticks. They didn't have anything. And it's because they had no real economy to actually manufacture and produce those different things. Now, was Russia, was, was, was Putin, do you, if you know this, this was not in the doc, this is me just rummaging your brain. Was he like seen as like, like a new hope? I think when he took over, yes. yeah, I think because y- Yeltsin and I re- was talking to Dante about this too, that I remember being a kid and seeing like cartoons in, in New York Times and things like that of Boris Yeltsin, who was the first president of Russia um, he was like a goof. He was a poor, yeah. He's this big, fat, you know, alcoholic. Um, and they just portrayed him as like this bumbling, drunk idiot the entire time. <laughs> they did time. In this too. They showed him drinking. Well, like, I think that was probably time. part, like, might be partially true for sure. You know, like that. This is a guy. Maybe like you know, this is a guy that we backed. You know, like hey, like this is your Soviet Union's dead. All the Belarus and all the Ukraine and all these places became like independent. I guess Ukraine already was, but uh, these independent countries and the whole satellite nation empire of of the of the USSR was done, and Russia was left. And it was like, okay, well, this is going to be the guy. It's Yeltsin, and like I remember seeing things with him and George Bush, and him, thing with him, with him and Clinton. And yeah, like I think Putin, when Putin came in, it was like, this is an old school guy. This is a KGB guy. This is, you know, a guy who could be, you know, portrayed as a new hope and end this era of, you know, weakness and corruption. And like there was also like a borderline and I didn't I never knew this, like a borderline civil war that they talked about in the doc Mm -hmm. where they had the guy um, over there. They're going to rattle his cage a little bit. They flew him out to 
America. Uh, who is the guy that we've been making fun of? Um, the the main guy, Gushin? Gushin, Gushin, Gushin. So they fly Gushin to America, like, hey, like, get your fucking act together. And they're trying, and, they, and he's just like, I'm <laughs> in America, funny. like, this is great. He's like, I just feed her up. He's at the pool. He's watching TV. He's like, they tried to like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll fix it. We'll fix it. Punish him, and they like bring him out. He's like, I'm on vacation. Like I'm in Southern California. Like I'm on vacation. And uh, but then when he flipped on the TV, and it was like, the Russian army is attacking. Uh, parliament parliament because parliament was like we were trying to take control from yeltsin and so they had like a mini quasi like little skirmish civil war and it was like hey like don't fuck with yeltsin and he just sent the army on their own like elected government so like that was fucking crazy and uh yeah so i think putin was probably a guy who was in charge of you know turning everything around and kind of in some ways, I guess, did. And obviously, he's made things fucking horrible for them, too. But that was definitely a thing. Yeah, man. I, it was, And for these players, I couldn't imagine. Like, you got to listen to yourself, like what you think. You got to listen to the people on the streets. You listen to your coaches. Then the mob's advice. Like, it was an impossible yeah. situation. And, like, who knows, like, from the mob, right? It's like, hey, like, you better lose to St. Petersburg next week. You know, I'm sure there's some of that going oh, on, too. yeah. So I was talking to Chief about this. Like I looked up, uh, I forgot about what a big deal it was when Bure came to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like a huge, he was, and he was awesome thing for the league. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were like alluding to like the mob ties with some of the players, and um, you know, like the mob would get in touch with them basically and be like, "Hey, it would be a shame if like something were to happen to your family." You know, so they would like extort some of these players and there's still I asked Chief about this, there's still like whispers about Ovechkin's ties to the mob like today. Which well, I, I had no idea about. Well, that's the thing where the line gets muddled now because one of the things that you could say about Putin is that he's kind of legitimized the mob. Right. You know, like those are now like oligarchs. And that he's kind of brought them into the fold instead of fighting against them. So if you could say he, he might not have ties directly to the Russian mafia, but he has ties directly to Putin. Like the Lubomov guy that was in this uh, doc and was talking the whole time mm -hmm. about like, you know, me and every other successful businessman in Russia, we earned everything we made. And then it like shows in. <laughs> At the bottom, it's like this yeah. man's one of the most wanted funny. people yeah. by Interpol in the world. Yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. no, but you're exactly right. Like, yeah, and like this, I just pulled up an article from 2017, and it's basically uh, Alex Ovechkin has skated between two worlds: a country of his birth and his professional home. And he's just like today he had a, um, an announcement. This is back again, 2017. Today I want to announce a social movement in the name of Putin team. Um, Ovechkin wrote be part of this team to me it's a privilege it's like the feeling of when you put on the jersey of the russian hockey team knowing that the whole country is rooting for you so like he's like he's like out front being like i'm a putin fucking guy and like you know i remember when there was there was whispers that when the olympics were in sochi that we were not going to send u.s players or we're not going to send nhl players and Ovechkin was basically like, fuck you. I'll never play. If you don't let us go to play in our Olympic games in our home country, I will never play in the United States again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they, you know, the United States sent, sent, you know, the NHL allowed the players to go. And that was like the TJ Oshie Olympics. And it was, you know, it was awesome. It was a big success. But this was after that. And then if you look at the flip side of that coin is Panarin, um, you know, the Rangers, obviously formerly with the Hawks, has been a very outspoken critic of Putin. And he got into trouble with Putin last year. They had they dug up some article or like basically made up a story saying that Panarin sexually assaulted somebody when he was seventeen, and they were trying to like end him. They were trying to get him canceled, and it How turned to, fucked up. Turned out How? to be all bullshit. Confirmed this is confirmed. Confirmed it was bullshit. The Rangers came out right away saying like, "Hey, like this is bullshit," and then he had to take like two weeks off. They probably make the playoffs if he doesn't do this because they were like right there. And he has to take two weeks off, and he took two weeks off because he was like, "I have to get my family out of Russia, because they're not they're being threatened there too." And it's because he is like an outspoken critic, and he was like, he had like a couple Instagram posts supporting the guy Navalny, who we did a dog walk mm -hmm. about, and um, so like Panarin is a guy who is like very anti-Putin, 
uh, where as Ovechkin is like definitely in bed with Putin. And there was to the to the point that I know uh, there were rumors that it was discussed that, you know, he was a free agent this summer that he might just go back and play, get fucking twenty million dollars a year and who knows in perpetuity from like oil rights deals or whatever to go back and play in Russia. And well, then and is, that, is, sorry, is that what happened to Kovalchuk? Sorry to cut you off. That, that that's a rumor with Kovalchuk okay. too. So he went over, he was like he signed for big money with the Devils, and then he went over to Russia and got like fifteen million dollars. Out a of year, nowhere. Out of nowhere. Like a year or so into the contract. And uh, so but this is a little bit different because Ovechkin technically this summer was not under contract. But they said that it, it was like discussed with the Russian government what he should do and end up signing a new contract because they thought it would be better for Russia if Ovechkin stayed in North America, stayed in the NHL, and broke Gretzky's all time goal scoring record. So, like, he needs another, he's, mm. he, he is like narrowing in on that. But it was not wow. like they, I, I read somewhere, and who knows how true it is, but it was like a joint decision and, and a decision that Ovechkin like definitely was not necessarily like allowed to make on his own, supposedly. But you'd feel he'd have so much clout at this point to be like, "Hey, let me fucking come home," or or, or like, "Let me fucking break the all time greatest record there is in hockey," which is yeah, that yeah, yeah, that yeah, goal yeah. scoring like thing. Way. And the, and they're like, "Yeah, like, you know, he needs an." He it needs, would be a huge deal. It would oh it would be huge. It's got seven thirty right now. And how and what's the eight ninety four something like that? Look it up. How old is he? Thirty five. Oh wow, he's got he can do it. Yeah, he could probably do it. That'd be it, it, crazy. It is so I've got it up right now. So Gretzky is credit to my brain. It is it is eight ninety four. He's number one. He's the next closest guy is Howe at eight oh one. So Gretzky's got. I got 100 goals over the next that closest guy. But, yes, yeah, so he's at 730. Yeah, Vashkin's so, 35, turns 36 in yeah. mid-September. So. But, like, the way he plays, like. He'll be fine. He can just be on the – he can get 25 a year on the power play, you know. So, Do you think he'll go back? I think he'll go back. Afterwards, when, it's, when he's retired? Yes. Uh, yeah, I do. So yeah. I, I think he'll. I think he'll. I definitely think he'll move back to Russia. Yeah. So is their league legit now? It's more legit. Like we should. We could probably do a. Uh, is it the K or no? KHL. It is okay. Yeah. So we could probably do an episode on that at some point. We get, <laughs> get uh, the guy who's been on Chicklets before, Tim Stapleton. He's from here, and he played in Russia. Okay. But that is. It is crazy. And now I had a buddy who played over there uh, for like maybe half a season or maybe one full season. And he was like a really good player, played at Boston College and um, had some time in the, in the American Hockey League. And they were basically, he signed like, I'm, and again, I don't know the exact numbers, but we'll, so I'll just say like, oh, he signed a $300,000 contract. And he was playing for some like shit bag team. And so the management came to him and goes, hey, like we're not paying you this month. And he's like, what do you mean? I have a contract. He's like, yeah, but you're not playing well. Jeez. And he's like, I, I think I'm playing well. He's like, no, you're not. So we're paying you a prorated hundred thousand dollars. Take it or leave it. Like that's how they operate. Like I mean, Wit played te- there. Tell him the Whit, other part. Wit though. played there, but Wit's like an NHL guy. So it's a little he, different. you know, like so he's going over there, and he probably had a little different experience. But it's not the same as playing here. Like the people, like even if you talk to Scott about playing in Austria, you know, like the guys show up like twenty minutes before the game. You know, it's just not the same. It's not it's the so same. Funny. It's so crazy. And it's like, yeah, let's just go like, and he would say like, you know, he lived in this like unbelievable like ski location and the coach would like cut practice short. He'd like, Hey, like, let's just get out of the mountain. So, you know, it's just like, dude, the hockey about, is just like a secondary thing. How about in this doc? Like you grow up and you, you know, the stereotype that Russians are always drinking vodka. I mean, it's legit. Like, these guys were bombed all all the time, twenty four seven. Yeah, twenty four seven. They were just drinking, 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 and they were like, "Yeah, we're assholes unless we're drunk. So in order for us to like conduct business, we have to get drunk so we can be <laughs> nice." Like bonkers. <laughs> it's crazy. Also, I I looked um, BRA. I just wanted to look him up. I was looking up his stats and. Mm-hmm. I had not realized at the moment. I thought later in his career he played with the Thrashers. I thought that was a Thrasher jersey. I mean, that's an unreal Canucks jersey. 
The one that they show the Dude, those, oh, yeah. those were oh, everywhere. Those were, they, they were in the Stanley Cup. They were they I went to Game those. Seven, the Stanley Cup Final with Beret in 1994. Those jerseys were everywhere when he sick. came. When they he brought came those the back a little bit last Did year. They? they became like sick. their alternate or two years ago, I think. And yeah, those are sick. They should wear those full time. He was such a big deal, dude. That that he was like, so nasty. That Canucks team too. No, yeah, he was. Sick. We were talking pre-show too about when they were showing all the footage from. 90s espn nhl coverage i was like oh man it, the nhl was so fucking great back then and espn was. did such a good job of like delivering the product too like Mark, I, I bet you guys can name more guys from the 90s than you can bro 100 percent. Sat there with pablo Bureau, uh, 100 off, i was like fuck yeah yeah man, let's go yeah like even they who was the third one they showed he wasn't russian i forgot who it was big star they showed oh, him in the middle oh, it was gretzky Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Duh, <laughs> duh, duh, duh. But I remember, like, I remember being like, "Oh, like you just, you just yeah. you know what I mean?" Yeah. No, they and like the name, like Mario. Like, if, if I still have like the all-time goal of records. Dude, they were here. making blockbuster movies revolving around hockey back yeah. then. Like that would yeah. never happen today. No, ever, no. ever. Dude, just like, those wings teams were like fucking. They're how, unbelievable. Star of the how star about of the when star. they plugged the owner Baldwin's? movie with john claude being oh, sudden uh, death yeah sudden death that, that was <laughs> the seventeen thousand people are held hostage and they don't even know so here comes john claude van damme to save the day we might have to do a watch of that and review that one show i would it's love so, dude, i haven't you seen, seen it, it lately i haven't seen it in it's, probably 20 years you know, i tough. haven't seen it but where i went to college there was this guy he must have been like a townie or a local he showed up to every tailgate in a sudden death jersey. That's unbelievable. Like, that was just that a is unbelievable. And he looked like the biggest, like Southern Illinois, like red mustache, thick glasses. Like he looked like the most just random Southern Illinois townie. And every tailgate he was at in a Southern sudden death. <laughs> That's so funny. Jersey. Uh, no, I mean, uh, talking through it, I guess I enjoyed it maybe that more than I. Yeah. But that's what you what you need a little background on it too. Yeah, like I think it, it I think it would have been better if they spent if like if it was a three part or HBO thing. I think it probably it could have gone into yeah. more and more it's, detail. It's tough to follow up action class yeah. action, yeah. action yeah. park class action park. But I think <laughs> I came in here say with some valid cons as well right? for sure with how they did, mm -hmm. portrayed it. But, but I did the story's insane. Don't get me wrong, but you're right. It is hard to follow up those two that we just saw because they were I thought they were pretty well done, all things considered. Um, but all right, that's it for today. Um, that's today's free swim. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow. We'll see you then.